All right. Welcome back to In Class with Carr, Greg Carr, <laughs> Professor, Dr. Greg Carr, Africana Studies, uh, brilliant man at Howard University. Uh, first of all, subscribe to this channel. Please subscribe Please. to the channel and then hit the like button, which is a thumbs up, because uh, Dr. Greg Carr is putting down some gems and y'all need to like it and then subscribe. Um, we were about to talk, we're going to have a whole history lesson, don't worry, but we were talking about the internet and we we're talking about this particular pandemic with coronavirus and how it has made it even more of a disparate or a, a tale of two cities. Whereas if you didn't have internet, you don't have a computer, you don't have access, you're not being educated. And as an educator, this is really scary that I think we're going to lose like a generation of, of young people because they're not plugged in. Yes. No, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you again, Karen, for this ongoing conversation. Um, I can't tell you how much feedback I've been getting, uh, not only from students that I would normally see in person, uh, my high school students in Philly and other places, college students, but probably more importantly, all the people who are not in college, which as we know, is the vast majority of people. So just feedback, I've been getting emails and people, you know, I want to thank you for it allowing me to be in the conversation with you and this platform, a platform that is not only trusted, but a platform where the expectation is where it should be for our people, which is I want things that are the highest quality in terms of conversation and content, and I want to be able to grasp them myself, argue with them, and as you say, you know, chew up the meat and bones. And there are very few bones in this conversation, but I promise you, I'm just grateful to be in it. Um, but, but I share your concern and, and our concern. And I can tell you that every educator I've talked to in the last month and a half since we've been in this situation, and I'm not just talking about college educators, I'm talking about everybody from first grade through high school, community college, and then, you know, we, we both know a lot of people share this concern. Uh, we are on the precipice of, as you say, a generation that certainly at best is going to face a tidal wave of opposition. And the opposition isn't just coming from the economy. It's coming from the educational system. Uh, we know that all over the country, you know, uh, school districts have struggled to get technology into the hands of our young people. But even when you distribute a Chromebook, which doesn't allow you to download hardware or to, or to download programs, but basically allows you access to the internet, even if you do have a computer at home, you may be in a situation where uh, there are several people trying to work on the device. If you have a, a parent or a caretaker or a guardian who happens to have the technology and has retained her or his job and isn't out there facing this sickness as a quote unquote essential personnel, which we know we they just reclassify service workers. Even if you have, maybe she's got to use the computer for work. Maybe you have older or younger siblings who also have lessons. So school districts have done, uh, basically they have called this a wrap. In other words, what they've said is, since we can't ensure that everybody has the technology they need, we, we're not going to call it social promotion, but we are prepared to understand that our major objective, and this is for the educators who want to help the students, we can't guarantee the quality of the content they're going to do. So our primary concern is at least their emotional health. And whenever we get them back, we'll start with wherever they are and try to catch them up. Well, we know, I'm not going to say that's impossible. Because that is the only thing that any educator can guarantee now is when we get you back, we'll see where you are and we'll move from there. But that means that finishing a semester, whether you're a college student, whether you're a high school or middle school or elementary school student, that's a crapshoot right now. And if we're not going to lose them, if we're not going to, of course, they're going to keep breathing, we pray. If you're not yes. sick or afraid, you know, for those who make it through, and you know, we got to fight with both fists to make sure that as many of us as possible make it through. Uh, we know that we're not going to lose you because you're going to be alive. But in terms of your intellectual development, in terms of your skill development, in terms of your capacity to come back into a space and continue your learning in some way, resuming what we were trying to do before this, I don't know what that looks like, but I'll tell you who has been planning for this for a long time. And that's these big companies, these big corporations, from the Googles to the Microsofts, who have been trying for a generation to move education online. And there are some benefits to that, of course. But one great disadvantage is if, uh, if you don't have the technology, if you don't have the connectivity, if there is a digital divide, then you are in a vulnerable position. And guess what? As you said, finally, 
we don't have the connectivity. We do not have the, the access to technology. And the digital divide that existed before this has gotten worse. So I, frankly, uh, I think we're facing a situation where we're gonna have to think very seriously and move very quickly to put some type of floor under all of our people, young or otherwise, so that our education is, to, for lack of a better term, jailbroken. We got to jailbreak this education system. You're right. You're, this is why, you know, why you thank me. I thank you for not just the scholarship. I thank you for going to law school. I thank you for getting your PhD mm -hmm. in, in history. Uh, I thank you for being available because we're going to need all of the great minds to come together at this point in time and figure out how we're going to educate the next generation of our kids. Um, at my core, I'm a teacher, which is why I get up every day with pleasure and joy in my heart to get on those airwaves, to get on these airwaves, because I want everyone listening to my voice to learn why. Because historically, education was that thing that they kept away from us because they understood that once we knew some things, that we could no longer be in bondage. Once That's we could read, we, could, we would know that bondage doesn't make any sense. So That's education true. has always been the thing that has kept us in bondage. That's right. That's and, right. And we know even with the incarceration rate, the majority of people, 90 plus percent of people who are incarcerated are what? Illiterate. They're illiterate. Yes. So, so as we look at that, you know, I, I know a lot of people undermine folks that read and know things. They, they look at that as like, you know, you think you're better than somebody. Yes, we are. Because we've <laughs> taken it. Listen, and if you want to be better, you too can be better. It's, it's, not, it's not an unattainable goal to be better. Right. And that should be the goal of all of us to be better every day that we get up to be better. So I, I, I'm, I'm so passionate about folks knowing things because it, it allows us to do more things and more of us that know, that are intellectually engaged, educationally engaged. So Absolutely. what we're going to do, I, I hope over the next several series is kind of lay the foundation of just put out some breadcrumbs. Hopefully people will chew on them like what they are tasting, come back for more, and we'll just keep feeding because knowledge stacks. You know, as you tell me something, I'm writing it down, and then I'm, I'm ordering Same here. You books. see, I got my jewelry. Man, <laughs> you got me reading books now. I wasn't even thinking about. And no, I'm like. Y'all, <laughs> hey, look, y'all watching this. You know, Karen's telling the truth, but she, 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 you know, like in jazz. Up and say you don't have to play all the notes. Just put a note here, and in between the notes, you gotta think through the spaces in between. Some of the space that Karen is leaving between the notes, like being a professor at Hunter College, like being a teacher all this time, she's leaving out space. So don't let don't let nobody believe she wasn't reading books before this. She's oh, no, 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 and I am too, and I'm taking notes the same as you are. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. You know, you you lead us down these paths where I need to know more about. Lerone Bennett, I need to know more about, Absolutely. like, I'm gonna go on my own, because that's, that's, what, that's what education really is. It's not that's about right. regurgitating some, a Ooh. set of facts and data, right? Say that We've again. talked about this before. So, so I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful that you're here. We're gonna keep having this conversation, but I, I'm, I'm afraid, and I'm not afraid of much, but I'm afraid that this digital divide, and they were already trying it with the net neutrality stuff. Right. It's, it's, it's kind of ironic, right? Net neutrality, 5G, all, all of these things are happening. They want you to pay more to get faster internet. Now I'm seeing even my internet, I got booted off the air uh, on Friday. I couldn't connect to my show because my internet went out. Oh, and no. I'm, yeah, and I, like, like I got a live show. I'm plugged into the ethernet. I got my router and right. I didn't have any juice. And I'm like, no, what the no. freak? I pay please, for this. Please, under listen, this, people, please understand. If you're watching this, you're vulnerable. Meaning what? Karen is not at your house. I'm not at your house. Between you all and us, between myself and Professor Hunter, there is technology. The minute this thing has an intermediary, intermediary called the, uh, the technological intermediary, you know, as a guy there in, in New York at Columbia, Tim Wu, W-U, interesting guy, professor of law, uh, who has written an, about this question of digital access. And he wrote a book uh, a few years ago called The Master Switch. And he talks about the fact Look, that- Hold on, wait a minute, in, Dr. Carr. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm surprised. In fact, I don't know, going back to your archives, I don't think, man, Karen probably has had Tim Wu. He's at I've not had I've Tim Wu I've never Wu met on. him. Okay, The Master Switch. The Master Switch. And, and what Wu does in that book is walk us through the history of how companies have- um, have basically served as this intermediary when it comes to technology. 
So this isn't anything new. What's new is the form of technology. And of course, in the title of the book is the threat, meaning what? If there's somebody between us that we're not together in real time, that means they can always turn the master switch off. <laughs> so people ask me all the time, well, you know, uh, Greg, why do you always want to buy the book? Even if it's an ebook and they say, no, 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 please understand. I will never be a victim of the master switch. Meaning <laughs> what? All of y'all books are in the cloud. So the minute something happens and they turn the master switch off or it goes off by mistake or something, or you don't pay your bill to your point on the digital divide, please, y'all, look at what they're doing with these digital divide, with these uh the, this slow and fast internet business coming out of the FCC. Please understand that. If they ever mess with that master switch, we have to be able to keep going. So as you're describing education and what we're doing, I love the metaphor of breadcrumbs. You know, our ancestors didn't have this technology. The technology that our oppressors were terrified of was, in fact, as, as it was put, I think Du Bois wrote this in Black Reconstruction, the, the, the technology that they were terrified of us acquiring was the spelling book, the pencil, and the paper. Understand, that's technology too. But it's like, we got to keep this technology away from them. Now it's all online. But when you talk about education and breadcrumbs, that is to fire the imagination. And then you can acquire your education everywhere. That's why in public policy. And I thought it was very, I mean, what you did with, uh, with our brother, Jared Ball, Dr. Ball out of Morgan State, another one of our HBCUs, brilliant brother, I thought was, was very powerful because by acknowledging, by getting my brother to acknowledge and, and embrace the fact, it's not that we don't have buying power. It's that we're not organized to the level we have to be. And as the point you kind of brought out with him, we have to have a mindset shift, a cultural shift to understand the difference. So as Jared would say, and did say in his book, The Myth of Black Mind Power, and as you brought out in the conversation, this requires us now to make demands on the entities that take our resources. All of us pay taxes. You say, some people don't pay tax. If you paid sales tax, you paid tax. If you bought a lottery ticket, you paid the tax. Where's that money going? Well, let's take one example. Public libraries. August Wilson, the great playwright, dropped out of high school. He said, I got my education at the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, the public library. As you all are watching these videos, if you go to your public library or go on the internet and say, I want a digital download of a book that, I, that they were talking about, I need to get Tim Wu's book. If they write you back and say, we don't have any copies, budget cuts, that's when you elect people to your city council, to your township council, that's to make the demand to get you the information. The breadcrumbs are to take you to the institutions. So you don't look at this as the end, this is the beginning. The only other thing I'd say in terms of this conversation we're having as, as it relates to education, you've really lined it out, Karen, I think beautifully. Thanks. Education was never an elite practice for African people. Uh, our, our friend, the, the late Asa Hiri, a very good friend in Jagna, Asa Hiri, used to say, all human beings learn. That's what we're hardwired to do. Any human being, a child is watching you and the next thing you know, she can talk. Whatever, my brain is hearing and I'm now gonna communicate. We're hardwired to learn. The only question is, how do you formalize that? W.E.B. Du Bois, in a, in a talk he gave, a commencement speech to HBCU, this was back in the 1930s. I think it was Fisk, actually. It might have been his, his talk, The Field and Function of the Negro College. He asked the question, what is the function of a Black education system, a, a Negro school or a Black school in this moment? He says, I once saw a perfect system of education. It was on the banks of a river under a tree in West Africa. Meaning what? You had a circle of young people, a teacher, and they were learning and teaching. What is he, what he said, this system has been improved upon by technology, by the, but ultimately that is the learning enterprise. So as you're given these breadcrumbs, as we think through these lessons, we understand that everybody is learning everywhere, but we have now in this society separated learning to make it say, well, this is an elite thing. No, 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 no. The corner boys, how'd you learn how to hustle, man? How you learn how to uh, trade that herb? I was in the learning circle, except this was the subject and this is the institution. But when you mention prisons, I don't think there's any more important institution for us to reimagine. While we think about, as Angela Davis would say, abolishing prisons. While we think about, as Michelle Alexander would say, 
ending in, in mass incarceration. Or Charcy McIntyre, who said it two generations before her in her book, Criminalizing a Race. You know, it was, we're thinking about it, prisons, let us always remember that out of the prisons came Malcolm X. Out of the prisons, uh, the right Mumia Abu Jamal. Out of the prisons came a whole generation and more of writers. Joy James wrote a book uh, called Prison Intellectuals, where she says, when you're in prison, here's the thing that you have the possibility of using that is the only resource we have, really, when we think about it in, in existence. What is the one resource we have? Time. And it's no accident that these human beings incarcerated in mass incarceration now empty and say, I could use my time differently. Now, when cats come out of prison who became Muslims, you're Muslim now. Yeah, because I embrace Islam because it's the one religion where I ain't got to deal with this whiteness. Okay, but now I got to read the Quran. Wait a minute, you went in barely able to read the English language. Now you read, read Arabic. Arabic. Yes, because right. I, I took my mind and applied it to time. This right. is what we're talking about. We got to rethink education, look at our time, and use it differently. And that's why, uh, I should say one other thing, Carter Woodson, as we know, wrote his book, The Miseducation of the Negro, 1933, which was a series of newspaper articles. He, he's, he's trying to be a journalist like you are. He's writing these newspaper articles and he puts them together in 1933. But a lot of folks may not know that an earlier book that Woodson wrote was called The Education of the Negro prior to 1861. And if we do basic math, we say, wait, wait, 1861, that was the year the Civil War what was the year after the Civil War jumped off? Yeah, so what he's talking about is Black people in slavery, sneaking, learn how to read, putting together in the tree, outside, in the yard, or wherever, sneak schools. If you are alive, you can breathe, you can hear this, you can write something down, you can educate yourself. And when they pull the master switch, you can keep educating yourself. And that's what we got to do. And how powerful is education? Not only was it illegal to for a, an embondaged person to read during right. Amer colonial slavery. That's right. I think about Socrates. <laughs> Socrates. Come on now. Same circle, right? What was his crime, Dr. Gray Carr? What was Socrates' crime that he had to drink hem hemlock and kill himself? Socrates to was death. accused of corrupting the youth because he was teaching against the doctrine of the day in the Greeks. And of course, Socrates, in many ways, the, the folks who have studied ancient Egypt would tell you and of course this is a place i've been to almost a dozen times now every august we take students and we teach egyptian hieroglyphs at howard dr mario Beatty, who is the world's wow. finest student of egyptian hieroglyphs who teaches at hbcu but every every year we go and we stand in those temples and what we began to understand through study is that what socrates was doing for which he was convicted of the highest crime corrupting the youth of greece and they they they, they, they they're learning things that we don't teach so you got to drink this hemlock, it's heresy. But what Socrates was practicing was actually the format for scribal education in Africa, in Egypt. And when we look past Socrates to Plato, when we look at Anaximander, when we look at Thales of Miletus, uh, Theophilo Benga has written about this. He did a book called An African Philosophy, A Lost Tradition. In fact, uh, he was teaching at Temple at the time and I was his research assistant. So I actually helped him draft that book. So, but Dr. Obengo was the junior protege, still is, he's still alive in Congo, he's in his 80s now, of Sheikh Ante Joe, the great Sheikh Ante Joe. And what they established was that these early Greeks, and you don't have to take anybody's word for it, you can read what Thales wrote, you can read what Plato wrote. There's a book called Scolium, where you see Plato talking about the fact, he says, you know, the Greek education system is not fit for pigs. He says, the Egyptian education system, however, teaches a person to become more human. So what Socrates was being persecuted for, ultimately killed for, was helping these young people achieve a level of self-awareness and humanity that was a threat to the Athenian state, in part because Greece was never a democracy. Greece was a hierarchy with an elite class. Women ain't had no rights. Enslaved people ain't had no rights. And this lie they tell us now, oh, Egyptian, I mean, a uh, Greek democracy find it in the literature. It's not there. Socrates is jailbreaking education and they made him kill himself for it, Karen. They, yes, you, that was you, my point. And I'm gonna take yes. you all the way back. So what you're saying in closing, Dr. Carr, yes. is that education 
true education, the system of education is part of our DNA. It's not, it is part of our DNA as human beings. It is part of our tradition as people of African descent in formalizing that DNA in institutions. You can't find an institution in the world where education is not practiced, but when you jam it all together in a settler state like the one we live in now, people are educated to the level that the state and the economic interests and those in power decide they need them for. So if you're not getting education in your school, ask yourself a basic question. What kind of society do I live in and who's making decisions that would leave me so vulnerable that the thing I've dreamt about being since I was a child, I can't figure out a path to by using this system. That wasn't accidental. This system is not broken. It's working the way it's supposed to work. And as we face this pandemic and are now facing this digital divide that's only going to widen unless we do something about it, we've got to ask ourselves an even more serious question. Who among the decision makers are making decisions that are going to threaten this next generation with possibly disappearing from the political economy? And so, yes, the function of education is in our DNA, it is in our traditions, it is in our memory long before we ever came through enslavement. We held on to it through, in, through enslavement. We adapted it to our circumstance. We fought to achieve it. And now that it's under assault again, I think we might just have to go on and bust this thing out and finally win once and for all, once we understand that's how far back it goes. Well, I'm here for it. I'm here Me for too. it. You're here for it. <laughs> Guys, too. subscribe to this channel. Stay tuned because we're going to keep having these conversations. Subscribe, yeah. hit the like button because Dr. Gray Carr is dope. Uh, in class with, with Carr, uh, thank you for being here today, sir. Appreciate Prof, it. Thank you. You were the one. Listen, we're going to do it. Thank you. I'm with you. We'll be back.